think we're going now. Well, where were we? I'm listening. I'm listening. <laughs> Verse 2, he said, Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, of which I will tell you. Any? Go ahead. What version of, is this? The NASB. The NASB, okay. So the NIV is. I mean, I know given an offering is it's the same. I mean, it's the same thing, but the word sacrifice is nice. Uh, yeah, no, I'm good. I mean, I would, I would struggle. <laughs> yeah, I um, <laughs> verse three. I, I'm getting ahead. I realize. But I'm what stuck out in in? Sorry to interrupt you. When it says, now your son, your only son, I mean, did they just completely forget about Ishmael? Mm. I think he was disinherited. Well, I know, but I guess, I guess that's kind of what happened in the previous chapter, right? Right. Good point. Good point. That is a very good point. And we know that Isaac is the son of promise. Not that Ishmael didn't receive his own blessings. God, the Lord made that very clear that he was going to take care of Ishmael, right? Mm -hmm. But Isaac is the child of promise and the symbol of God's promises through Abraham, which God has made clear to Abraham, not necessarily that Abraham has like embraced completely, right? Because Abraham was like, oh, what about Ishmael, right? So God says, take now your son, and then says again, your only son, whom you love, you love Isaac. So he says, as if we didn't know who it was. Mm -hmm. uh, he says it four ways, right? If right. you didn't already know, he could have just said Isaac or your son because Ishmael's already gone. Right. Um, I would have um, the human part of me says, I would probably have, you're kidding me. I, I'm here. You want me to get it? Give you and. I'm going to kill my my only son. But the spiritual part says, you know, there is God has got something going for us. Well, we know God is testing Abraham. We haven't maybe conjectured as to why He's testing him here. I don't know. Maybe should we ask that question? Why is Abraham being tested here? To see if he trusts God, I guess. I mean, if he said something like that to me, I'd say, forget you. <laughs> yeah. Just go somewhere and get lost, you know. <laughs> I'm not going to give up my kids. I, I would be like Moses. And he's like, uh, choose someone else. It's like, choose someone else that's going to take up there. Like, but. Well, he, God also tested Noah when he told him to build the ark. Oh, yeah. So God always has a reason for his test. He is a great teacher of prophets. And we do need to trust him. And that's what he wanted Abraham to do. I just don't know if I could have, you know, done what he did. He just did it. Yeah. Well, certainly we know that any kind of human sacrifice is truly against the God that we love and serve. And I want to say we should know that other religions and worship and things at the time often did involve that heinous act of child or human sacrifice of a different kind of blood <laughs> as of an offering. Um, and if God himself, the God of Abraham, was to set himself apart Right, which you would think he's already done, but Abraham's already answered, and here we have his promise. This would almost be a temptation to 
believed that the God he'd been serving was a part of what we would say, well, obviously not a part of God, right? This would lend him to the other religions and, and cult worship uh, of everywhere around. So in a way, his test um, wasn't just about Abraham's faithfulness or Abraham's obedience or Abraham's trust. It was also about the very nature of the God that Abraham had been trusting. Like, do you trust who I truly am? Um, because this, this wouldn't go, right? None of what God asked him to do here would make any sense to him. Surely, now, after all these years, he's waited. You know, I think maybe, especially since we've been going chapter by chapter, suddenly this like has even more weight to me. Like, oh my gosh. Like, finally, Isaac, right? Um, now, how old would Isaac have been at the time? I mean, because he would be at least a toddler in the previous chapter, in chapter 21. I think he was 12, if I remember correctly from the chapter. It doesn't, it doesn't tell us how old Isaac is in the last chapter. It just tells us after he had been weaned. Yeah. There are... Common, there's commentary that would suggest that um, that terminology means like able to make sort of some decisions on its own. Like commentary might suggest it's either three or maybe it's seven or maybe it's twelve. So commentary is even sort of kind of all over the place, but. All it just says is that after he was weaned. Old enough to carry a block of wood, as we're going to read a little bit later. Yeah, right? that's true. There are several blocks. Right, so I'm right. thinking, I mean, if, like Reverend said, if he's 12, uh, later on... He, the I chapter would, before tells us that, yeah. I would have a... Okay, I'll wait. But yeah, there's all kinds of... <laughs> Uh, verse 3, so Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac, his son, in case we didn't know, and he split wood for the burnt offering, and arose, and went to the place of which God had told him. There's like a little hidden commentary in here that God was really leading him to a certain place, and as opposed to other places where, like, uh, where, where we're told exactly where that is when, like, the character might hear it or a person might hear it. Here it's just, like, background. Mm -hmm. And I think that's uh, moreover, even moreover to Abraham being obedient and listening. So much to the fact that the other details there aren't quite as important, but that they think his answering to it is. I, I have a note that in verse 2, the word love is the first mention of the word love in the Bible. Ooh. Ooh. Isn't that interesting? It is, especially in the context of a sacrifice of, of a child. Um, when you think of, uh, sorry, when you think of New Testament, um, this, this whole passage screams of Jesus screams of New Testament yeah. um, and the symbolism here too just even in the phrase I am uh, I mean it might feel silly in English but to even God as we've called him in scripture is a part of that response mm -hmm. even to himself if you think of it that way 
Oh, the love, first. obey, and worship, it says. It's the first time they're used in the Bible. And then it, and then it has eight. Which makes this... Uh, and the NIV is actually before that. But the NIV, NIV, and maybe it's just the translation to NIV made it more common knowledge. Mm -hmm. Because it talks about an Adam made love to Eve. Mm -hmm. But this would make more sense because the Apple is in. That's probably because they didn't want to say sex. Correct. <laughs> yeah, and, I mean, which is true. <laughs> Frankly, in yeah. the NIV translation, that's that's probably yeah. Like, they would have made it more, but, but they didn't want to use another euphemism like he came into her or right. anything like that, right? On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Um, I don't want to make much ado about that verse, except this is we're going to see the raising of his eyes again, and so I probably should have noted it as a, a part to repeat. The raising of his eyes. Um, oh, that would indicate that's in relative. Yeah, it could be very simple, and I might be over. Um, I might be making it overly figurative that I think it's important, like that motion. In, in the book that I've been reading, it mentions it had uh, a couple. Can you speak up though, so yes. I don't have yeah. to re say what you say? So there's a book that I'm reading at the New Interpretation of Genesis. Called the original sin, and it talks about raising it. It has a couple paragraphs that talking about Abraham raising his eyes, and that was to give reference to God. That he, God told him to go to this mountain. So by raising his eyes, it's where people have saw God a lot. It was in the mountains with Abraham and Moses. I mean, it goes on. I mean, there's a lot of times where. He that he, that God will meet them at the in the mountain. So, um, that's really cool. Um, Abraham said. Also, could be very simple. Like uh, Harold says, you could yeah. just been like, oh, he looked up because it was yeah. high, right? Could have <laughs> well, been. Could have been the same, here, right? Well, it also says. Uh, he looked up and saw the place in the distance. Which would indicate the, that since Israel is a flat place, per se, it would have to be in the mountain. Mm -hmm. So it from a distance. Abraham said to his young men in verse 5, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over there, and we will worship and return to you. Um, I shouldn't make much... I probably am overthinking this part too, but again, the figurativeness of this language of worship and a return um, is such a powerful image throughout the entire Old Testament. If you consider the words later, return to me, I'll return to you of God himself. And they hear this, hear Abraham saying, we will go in our offering and our sacrifice to my obedience, we will worship. And I will return. I know he's saying it to his people that he came with, but it's almost too, um, I don't know. It doesn't feel like it's an accident. It's because it's just a whole, it's a theme of the Old Testament of returning to God. And if this is a test to Abraham, I want to go back to our original question. Maybe Abraham needed to be tested. Um, I don't know. Maybe he needed that at that moment. Maybe he needed a real return to the child, to the promise that God had already delivered to him. I know that's maybe going over the top with interpreting that, but um, I'm just throwing it out as... Well, I think that Abraham was confident that God would have a substitute because God says we will worship and then we will come back to you, using we in the plural. So he was confident that God would take care of a sacrifice. Or he didn't want to freak his son out. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, yeah. Yeah, but I see what you're, I've heard that before too, Harold, that 
he just had such faith when when he went up the mountain that that he he believed he would still come back with Isaac that he was going to do what he was called to do in obedience but well any other way that he was Sarah would be kind of a lie well see but my thing with that is is God knows his heart and he knows his mind so if Abraham is really thinking that Isaac is going to come back with him or I'm sorry God is thinking if Abraham yeah if Abraham is thinking oh God is going to really save Isaac from this then you know then, then that's not really trusting God and that's not what God wants Abraham to do God wants his complete trust in it you know, like he wants his complete trust to to surrender Isaac or, you know, to him, you know. So I think he he really wants that and yeah. and God knows what's on his heart. So if if he's not really really willing to surrender him to to the sac like have him be sacrificed, then God would know that and and he would have end up ended up dying. I, that's what I think, anyway. Don't spoil the story. Oh, no, I don't, I don't disagree, Cadet Audrey, at, at all. Um, mostly because I think we all put ourselves in what was Abraham thinking. Um, mm -hmm. And as I've reread and reread this, especially today, getting ready for Bible study, uh, the temptation to do that is so large. And I had to stop and ask myself, too. Um, I think... I had to stop and say to myself, probably the point of this is not putting myself in Abraham's shoes and say, wow, it's probably something else. Probably something dealing with who God is and what God is trying to show. Um, so so I totally agree with you, Cadet Audrey. Um, and I think it's very typical. Um, every time I read this passage again, I get taken back to what was he thinking? Um, it's just it's just human that we do that, um, and even though we know how the story ends, we want to presume what he was thinking before. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it, and maybe even like a, if he does have to die, God can raise him from the dead. You know, I mean, there's so many things to think like that. He his heart might have met in that moment that we will come back. To, it's hard to for sure say, but just that he was willing to do it, just that he was, it's well, crazy to think that. I mean, I, I don't I don't know that I could have ever, that I, that I could have done that, my children, you know, and I, I'm not trying to say like I'm trying to put myself in, Isaac, or in Abraham's shoes, but I know you're warning us against that, but it's hard not to because, especially as parents, hard not to um, and they had waited so long for this child they I mean the promised child what well Isaac Abraham sorry I'm saying all the words Abraham was a hundred years old when he was born so he waited for him all this time and then I don't know let's say he is 13 and he is bar mitzvah year um, <laughs> um, you know I, I think Whatever year it is for him, um, just say, gosh, God had already chosen or planned or had spoken into Abraham's life about what would happen through generation after generation. So I think he had to have remembered all those promises. Like, I'm just going to trust the Lord because he's, he promised me a son. The son is here. He's promised that I'm going to have a great nation and that generation after generation is going to be a great nation so I'm just going to have to go in with you know jump in the deep end with not just my pinky toe but all of me and just trust that God will provide it so here in verses 7 and 8 we have one of the most striking things is the child has a voice in the narrative and we have to consider that this does not happen very often in the biblical narrative itself. But the sacrifice speaks. Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, 
my father. And he said, here I am, my son. And then he said, behold, the fire and the wood. And then this question that tears at your heartstrings, right? But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Right? You can't read that without having a little chill in, into your bones, right? Is you hear him saying that, but uh, Abraham's response, I, I know we have, we could, we, this, this is whole chapter is probably worthy of like three or four nights. But Abraham said, after he'd already said, here I am, my son. Those, this has the follow-up to that, my son. This claims the child of promise. This claims Isaac as who he is. Um, and Abraham, from Isaac's voice, is claimed as his true father. There's a whole lot of things wrapped up in verse 7. But Abraham says, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Uh, and so to what Harold said before, like, he, you know, maybe Abraham was already believing that he knew that God would provide another sacrifice. And I think it's maybe this phrase especially that lends itself to thinking that. Um, but consider also, consider also the promise of Isaac as of Isaac as the promise, okay? That Isaac is the fulfillment of God, God's gift. Isaac represents God. Isaac is the Messiah in this picture. I'm not meaning to overly messianic in a way, but this is, he is Christ here in a way. And God himself has provided for himself the lamb for the burnt offering. This is there are a lot of parallels. I can see what yeah. you're saying there, but to say, yeah, I wouldn't go as far maybe as saying that Isaac is Christ, but I no, see just, that I in mean the parallels. Symbol, symbolic, yeah. that's right. Okay. Um, yes, no, Isaac is not Christ, no. but, but the parallels to God himself providing the sacrifice, and I don't mean the ram. I mean the promise that goes to all generations. Through Isaac, that God Himself is a part of that promise. Remember, Abraham wanted to deny it the whole time. Well, what about uh, Hagar? Uh, uh, what about Ishmael? What about everything else? Um, so it's a very, very powerful statement. Uh, sorry, I sort of monopolized conversation. My bad. Any other comments or questions? No, I mean I've never looked at it that way. To where saying that God. I guess it has to do with the version of the Bible, but I mean, it's saying that God will provide for himself. That right there is, like you said, it's, it's not comparable, but it's, it's a familiar story. And then God providing Jesus for his sacrifice. So I mean, he, yeah, that's good stuff. I love the way you said that a lot better than the way I said it. Prequel. Prequel. Yeah. And if we go back to the beginning of this section when we said that this part feels different, let's, just for the sake of argument, 
say that this whole dynamic is representative of the covenant and representative of a new relationship with God, right? Suddenly, the prequel of what that relationship looks like means a little more, I think, as we've read through this. Now, now has up through verse, up through verse eight, um, suddenly the dynamics of God's part in the covenant, God's part in that relationship, and people's obedience to that, suddenly it feels a little different. Even. You're gonna say something else? You're making funny faces, Rebby. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. I <laughs> He's taking it all in. Well, Repentance. to go off on prequel, prequel. I, really, I really, I really like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah prequel. prequel. That's a lot better than I said. Is that uh, <laughs> there's an old saying that if we don't learn from the past, we're going to repeat it. So it, it's, it could be the same thing is that, okay, they didn't learn that I will offer, I will ask one of my people to sacrifice their son for them. And, I don't know, maybe there's no, it's almost like it's the story before the bigger story, and we, the people in the, of these times are not the same. And so this was their way of saying, you're going to see chapter is different than it has been before. I know it seems like a small thing, but like so many, there are so many small things about this chapter. I even like the end of verse 8. So the two of them walked on together. Again, I'm really aligning this to a relationship and covenant. Um, it may have just been as simple as they just walked on together. <laughs> Again, I might be making this overly figurative. Um, but anyway, verse 9, uh, then they came to the place of which God had told him. Remember, we like he saw it, remember, the place he told him, and here it is again. And Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Verse 10, Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Now, had I been a 12-year-old boy with a hundred-something-year-old father, and he came at me with some rope, I would have been out of there so fast. Is, I would have been running like a mountain goat. That's exactly what I was thinking, is that I don't see how, when, when I read this, I'm looking, I'm like, okay, there's no way that Isaac is just going to stand there and laugh if that found him. But again, reference in that book that I'm reading, they said that God may have, there were several people that were commenting on this, on this one section that says God may have did a blinding light or did something to make Isaac more passive, to where he was incapacitated, or incapacitated, or, to, or I mean, to make him more willing to, listen, I'm not saying that it's, that he got up put him on drugs, but. Well, maybe he had his headphones like, on, or he's playing on his phone, and he didn't notice, <laughs> well, right? Yeah. He had his headphones on, and suddenly he's like, oh, I got tied on the top of this piece of wood. What's I mean, going the, on? The internet would have been slower than that. Yeah, <laughs> the internet was slower back then. Yeah. I find it difficult to think that uh, God would have blinded Isaac to what was going on. What? Now, that goes completely against character. Yeah, not, not blinded him, but the flash of light would have stunned him. Not, not blinded him to what was going on, but may, incapacitated him that way it made it able for uh, Abraham to put him on time of him and put him on the well, that would go against the character. I agree with Harold. Uh, and I know that maybe the first time 
but uh, <laughs> mostly because I don't think it would matter. Uh, we have to understand that it's a different culture, and so pushing on like, oh no, no, ten year old or twelve year old would have stayed there for that. Well, we actually don't know that, and I have to imagine too that there's a greater obedience in this uh, culture probably that we can understand, and certainly a greater level as they walk together and they're openly talking. And Harold, I think more of the character of what we've seen from Abraham and Isaac here, especially if thinking figuratively, to me, him being a willing sacrifice, um, even if he didn't understand it all, um, obviously that means more to me. Uh, but we don't really get an insight into that. That's a hidden part of the story. And I, I would leave a lot of commentaries saying, oh, you know, maybe this, maybe that. Um, but regardless, He's bound on top. We don't know if he's crying or afraid. or well, We don't know any of that. I'm, that's also, really... I'm also thinking that Isaac had been brought up by Abraham to fear, to, to fear God. And there have been, and Abraham would have been given several lessons on we can depend upon God to take care of us. Well, you brought up a really good point, Harold, and I don't know if you did it on accident or on purpose, but that Abraham would fear God and that he would uphold his part of the covenant, which we talked about several weeks ago, his part of raising his family in obedience, his part of teaching the ways of God, right? So if that's his part... Um, Maybe we see a reason for him to be tested. If that's his part of the covenant, um, maybe maybe we see cause as he's been doting upon his son. We see cause for him to be reminded of whose promise Isaac is. It's God's promise to him, right? So I know I, know I took it down a different way from what you said, but... It fits so perfectly with what, what we hear later from the angel of the Lord that I say, I don't know if you did it on a purpose or not, but I think you're brilliant, Harold. Uh, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. That's the third time we had the here I am, right? Here. From Abraham. Yes. And he said, they do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. I'm pausing because I feel like someone was going to say something there. Right? No, oh, it may have been a test also for Isaac to see how God would take care of him. I'm sure Isaac never forgot it. I'm sure he didn't. It was probably traumatized for life. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Every time someone reaches in the kitchen, he's like, oh! <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, um, saying like, hey, this is, this is actually not the way that I roll. Uh, it was more of a test of faith, and he doesn't, like, God is about the family, right? God isn't about uh, destroying the family. He's about keeping the family, like, alive, not to, not to destroy their own children. To that, Jacob, you weren't here when we mentioned it earlier before, but to that end, I, I was saying that part of this was God setting himself as a part of from all of those other pagan things and bloods. Right. And so to, to what you said, and this part then where 
Uh, now I know that you fear God. What if this is a testament to how Abraham truly understands the nature of God? I don't mean just in doing what God tells him to do. I mean understanding what their relationship truly is. Understanding who God truly is. And I'm saying that part of this fear, part of that separation from other cultures is part of Abraham actually knowing God. And I think there's a lot of credence to that even by the phrase, here I am. So suddenly, Abraham's insight into the nature of God uh, is tested. Um, suddenly, it's not just set apart from the other religions. It's set apart as something so intimate, right? So, so intimate with who he is and his son, whom he loves. So special. My like, gosh, it's giving, it's giving me goosebumps a little bit, right? I mean, I, I think the whole, this whole thing on Abraham's part um, is, is showing his commitment to the Lord, like, like, you know, like it's a test of his faith, but uh, I think, it, like you said, it kind of shows, like, how he understands God to be, uh, and he has a reverence for God, um, and I think he's learned that <laughs> because he hasn't always had that. He's kind of had to learn it as he's gone along, um, you know, like all the mistakes that he's made along the way. He had to realize that, um, like I just, I just gotta be a servant to the Lord, and uh, this is him showing that because. He did not want to kill his own son. I mean, he, he has shown that he loved his children. Um, and if we didn't know it, Scripture declared it like over and over to us, right? Yeah. And even in this passage. Yeah. And it's all about trust. I mean, the biggest thing is, does Abraham really trust me? So to say it's testing, it would be a test of that trust to say, okay, you trust that I'm going to provide for you no matter what. Right. If you trust me with son that I'm going to provide for you even though I'm telling you you're going to sacrifice me. Right. And, and we think about it, God already knew that Abraham did trust him. Correct. Uh, and so part of this too is for the sake of Abraham himself. Uh, and I think at least that that, uh, that God is showing, basically showing Abraham this is what you have committed to. Because God, God already knew what would happen if that, you know, because God is Obviously, omnipotent and uh, perfect, and and so uh, he he knows what's going to happen, and so this is for Abraham's benefit to show him uh, and to show him grace in that in this moment that's about to happen as well. Well, I would say that this was for Abraham's sake, even though it's maybe not a nice argument to like our feelings as we put ourselves in the story. Right? We've been talking about how we put ourselves in the story. I think what was shared right after that definitely lends credence to what you said, Jacob. Uh, oh, man, and I feel like we're just even getting to like the really juicy part of this chapter. Uh, then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, again, the raising of his eyes, and behold, behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns, and Abraham went, took the ram, and offered him up for a burnt offering, the place of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mouth of the Lord, it will be provided. So if the main point was uh, that God's provision and that he would trust in God's provision, uh, the fact that the whole episode is named, and God, the way that God has called even there, Jehovah Jireh, a reason for reflection of that. Obviously, that's a super strong argument. Right? Um, uh, with the same Malcolm that, the same that Max was given up, I don't know. I was wondering um, where this particular mountain is also in Israel, um, if it was maybe uh, the same mountain of Calvary. Uh, but I'm not a geography person, so I wouldn't know. But I was thinking when, when we were talking about all this, where was Sarah in all of this? Because you know what?
Yes. I mean, we sort of presume that, but I would definitely assume that with you. I think that goes back to the, he got up early in the morning, took a couple people, just a couple, <laughs> and left quickly before he had to explain much to anyone, right? And it took him three days to get there. And maybe, maybe we glossed over that part, right? It was on the third day that he raised up his eyes mm -hmm. and saw the place. And here it is on the third day, he raises his eyes again, sees the ram. This is the God who provides. Well, I know we got to keep going because this is, I mark this as, to me, one of the most important parts of the chapter, just to myself. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven. Remember, context. He has just passed the test. He has just given the name of uh, confess this name of the Lord, a name even so much that there's a saying to God provision. And God says to him and said, by myself, I have sworn, declares the Lord. Not that the Lord is swearing like <laughs> in a bad way, but we're right, right, not cussing. He is promising. He is promising and confirming a covenant, I'm going to say. Notice the conditions here. Because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Verse 17. Indeed, I will greatly bless you and I will greatly multiply your seeds as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. And, okay, so now I'm not trying to be preachy, but this has already been the promise of God. This is a same, this is maybe the sixth, seventh, eighth time we have heard this, but this time we, if if part of the premise of this chapter is relationship, this time we see that Abraham has to be a part in his obedience of the blessing that's going to come through him. He's expected to be a part of that. <coughs> You're looking at me strangely. Worried about you. Coming. No, sorry, it's my Diet Coke. Because you have done this thing, because you have obeyed my voice, this is one of the only sections in this whole Abrahamic covenant that we see his side of what God expects in this relationship. And that's why the relationship here between God and Abraham and all the descendants is so key. And Isaac, as we talked about like what Abraham is expected to do through his seed, through his children, how he is expected to raise them up. That's also part of the deal. Remember that from a couple chapters ago, right? So I marked that whole section because, um, oof, because we don't get a lot of his part in it. We like to say he was obedient. We like to say he was faithful. But we don't often say that Part of his relationship and part of being chosen by God was also his response of obedience and partly of what God expected from him. Ooh, sorry, I'm reminded of Saul, who did not respond in obedience, who did not respond in faithfulness. And Saul's blessing was taken away. And Abraham's here is confirmed. Here, he has shown his obedience. He has shown his righteousness. And God, I, I believe he was going to do it anyway, but he's basically saying you're worthy of the blessing you're going to receive, and it's going to be multiplied. I mean, really, how many times do we have to hear about it, right? This time, it feels different. Oof. Everybody online is being quiet. Are they? Maybe. Hopefully, I've missed a lot. <laughs> uh, the rest of the chapter, maybe, I'm not saying it's unimportant, but 
we see that Abraham did return. So Abraham returned to his young men. They arose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham lived at Beersheba. If you remember, that was where we ended the last chapter was Beersheba. Remember, and that's the name of the place, the place of the oath. It was a place of relationship, a place of this is my well, remember, with Abimelech. Now it came about after these things that it was told Abraham, saying, Behold, Milcah also has born children to your brother Nahor, Uz his first, not firstborn, you're reading mine, his firstborn, it's a typo, and Booz his brother, Kimuel, the father of Aram, and Cheesehead, I'm just kidding, Cheesehead, <laughs> Chess, there's a lot of funny games here, Chesed, and Hazo, and Pilvesh, and Jidlap, and Bethuel, Bethuel became the father of Rebekah, these eight Milcah bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother, his concubine, whose name was Ruma, also bore Teba, and Geham, and Tehash, and Mekah, Obviously, this is setting us up for Rebecca as a relation. Um, and this is also a commentary to, like, suddenly we are hearing about the rest of Abraham's family all the way, um, I want to say all the way back in Ur, but maybe it's Haran. But it might be as far as, or I kind of can't remember myself. Um, but we hear about the rest of his family I gotta understand if you depart from your family in big ways like that, it might be hard without the internet to uh, to know what's going on with everybody, right? Yeah. So, um, anyway, um, I know that was a sort of a quick gloss towards the end, especially such a really needy part. Um, but are there any other comments or questions? I know the time is growing late. salvation happened on the third day. Um, yeah. I also, kind of with that, um, when they talk about the ram, they, they use the ram for the altar. And, and it's, uh, and then of course Jesus is, you know, the lamb of God. God. Yeah. And um, if it wasn't for him, then we would all be Well, there isn't any offering in this story that wasn't provided by God. There was no part. I want to say that in the defining of relationship, it was even Abraham's own relationship to his son and to God that he had to reconcile for this sacrifice and for this offering. I would say it's much the same for us today. That it's our own reconciling to what is God's and his sacrifice for us. And our reconciling to what it means in that relationship for us to be obedient. Um, and maybe to recognize what is of God and what is not. Oh, all good comments all. I suppose uh, we're going to turn it over to Major Shannon for prayer requests. I'm gonna move the camera on you there too. Did you see we've got a whole bunch on here for requests? I wanna add Bobby to that too. I don't know if everybody knows who he is. for two weeks. And so she's going to be without her 
baby for two weeks. Um, he's almost two years old. Um, so it's going to be hard on her. Plus, knowing that he was exposed to the corona, and usually little kids don't get it, but they can be carriers, and they can bring it back to mom, so he has to be quarantined. Sure. What's, what's your... My granddaughter's name is Angela, and the baby is Dante, D-A-N-T-E, right? Okay, we definitely will pray about that. Let's see Dante. Well, my brother already hasn't gotten his results back yet, but he had his EKG uh, Monday. Uh, and continue praying for uh, Ken. Chemotherapy because he has to live in Iowa City quite often to get his chemotherapy. That's a long trip. Yeah, it is a long trip for sure. I know um, my father had what we think was a mild heart attack the other day, but it has been unconfirmed by the cardiologist and he's already been sent home. Um, so we're still. Um, She's still waiting for all the results of the test, even though they've already sent him home, which is weird. Um, but we want to lift him up in prayer. Also, uh, I don't know if everyone knows Bobby, um, Connie's boyfriend. He is uh, not doing, he's, he's not feeling well. His blood pressure's been very high. And I think I just saw Connie online too. So uh, she said it was uh, great for us to pray for him too. So she's really concerned about his spiking blood pressure because it causes his seizures and um, and I saw him tonight he's just not doing that great and so we want to pray for him too Well, um, cool that this is such a great portion of scripture. Um, always been one of my favorites, honestly. And just thinking about what offering means, what sacrifice means, what worship to the Lord means, and um, surrender and faith. I mean, so many things in there that are just so good for us to contemplate God's faithfulness, God's provision for us, and providing Jesus, ultimately, um, the ultimate one for us. And, Rebbe, I think you're right. I think it's the same. I looked it up in a couple different places. I think it's the same place. Mount Moriah is the same place. It, I looked at one website that, not that everything on the internet is true, but it did say it's also the place of Solomon's it's temple. Part of the Jewish tradition, I think. Yeah. But and that would be the same place as Calvary. So, pretty pretty awesome. Um, we're praying for Harmony House, for Deb's neighbor, and then all that was mentioned here. Um, just a scripture to close us. Um, when Sean was talking about lifting, lifting his eyes to heaven, of course it took me to this psalm. I will lift my eyes up to the mountains. Where shall my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. The Lord will guard your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. Lord, we do thank you that you are the God who provides, that you are the God from which our help comes from, Lord. And we praise you, Lord. We may not be able to see, even in this moment, what that means for our life, Lord, but we trust. Lord, and, and we walk one step 
together with you, Lord, um, sometimes up the mountain to the unknown, Lord, just trusting in faith, God, that you will provide for us. Um, and so, Lord, we just pray that you would increase our faith, God, to continue to, um, Lord, do as you have called us, to be obedient to you, Lord. And um, tonight we are so grateful. We worship you, Lord. We worship Jesus, who is, um, Lord, your only begotten son, your son whom you loved, um, that you sent for our sins, the ultimate provision for our lives, God. We thank you for that tonight, and we recognize, Lord, that we need you. We desperately need you in our lives. So um, we want to bring before you, Lord, um, the the prayers of our hearts for Harmony House, um, for Deb's neighbor, God. We pray for Bobby. Um, just ask that you'd be near to him and Connie. We pray for Dante, Lord. We first of all just pray that you would protect him from any sickness, Lord. And uh, we just ask that you'd be near to him as he's away from his mother. And, and we pray for Angela as well, God. We pray for Larry as he's waiting on test results and just trust you, Lord, with all of those. We continue to lift up Ken and um, just be with him and all of his appointments in Iowa City and, and the chemo that he has, Lord, and, and just pray that you would strengthen his body. We pray for David, Thies, and just ask, Lord, that you would be near to him and Lois um, during this time, God. Um, and we, of course, think about the Youth Center kids, God, um, our kids, Lord, who you've entrusted to our care, and we just pray that you would protect and guide each one of them. Lord, you know what's going on in their lives. And um, we just pray, Lord, that as we have been entrusted with just a sh few short hours during their day, Lord, that um, everyone here at the Salvation Army would be um, pointing them to you, God, not to ourselves, not to the Salvation Army, Lord, but to you yes. as the maker of heaven and earth, Lord, who knows their circumstances, who loves them, who has a plan and a purpose for each of their lives, and we trust you with that. Thank you, God, for your word. It is living and active and applicable even in our current circumstances, God. We, we love you tonight. We thank you for discussion around this table and that we can break the bread of your word together and um, how it feeds our souls, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. God bless you guys. Have a good one.